Ohio and these twins. Well, first of all, thank all of you for letting us present our findings and listening to our ideas about the nursing. To me, the beginning point of any discussion that we have about the police right now has to be the recognition that crime in America is at historically low levels. If you look at the Bureau of Justice statistics, the violent crime rate in 2015 was 23% of what it was in 1993. The property crime rate was 32%. We do talk about, and we hear and we'll hear on this panel, about cities like Chicago and Baltimore that are struggling with violent shootings, but I think we should all recognize that even in those cities, the overall rate of violent crime is dramatically reduced from what it was 25 or 30 years ago. Given that we are in an era of historically low crime, it's not surprising that the discussions that have been swirling around about the police in the last decade have really not been about the crime rate. People in the communities in America in general are not worried about crime being out of control. They're not talking about the police being unable to control crime. To me, the key point is that this low crime era gives us an opportunity to step back and talk about what beyond crime control should be the basis for policing in a democratic society. And in particular, I think it gives us an opportunity to talk about the idea of popular legitimacy. What is popular legitimacy? It's the belief among the people in the community that the police are entitled to exercise authority, entitled to make decisions about how to manage crime in their communities. In the popular media, you often see this as referred to as trust in the police. My suggestion is that policing in a democratic society needs to be attuned to this issue of popular legitimacy. <laughs> so a beginning point for talking about popular legitimacy is to note that even though the crime rate has declined dramatically, as I mentioned, public trust in the police has not basically changed in the last 30 years. In 1993, 52% of Americans said they had trust in their local police. In 2016, it was 56%. So basically, even though we've seen these dramatic declines in crime, we haven't seen increases in public trust in the police. As a consequence, I think the question we should be asking is whether we can have policing policies that both produce crime control and enhance popular legitimacy, enhance trust in the police. Since the police have generally defined their mission in America in the last several decades as being about crime control, it's striking that these dramatic crime control declines have not produced more legitimacy. Police leaders have generally assumed that if they got crime under control, they would have the support of the public, and that is something that I think is surprising to many police leaders that they have not seen this happen. We know from research that one of the key findings is that public trust in the police is not related to either judgments about the crime rate or judgments about the effectiveness of the police in controlling crime. So it's not surprising to researchers that we see this disjuncture. What does produce public trust in the police? We know from research that people focus their attention very directly on their views about how fairly the police exercise their authority in different communities, something that we call procedural justice. That refers to four different aspects of the exercise of police authority. One is voice, that people feel the police listen to them when they decide how to police their community, let them tell their side of the story when they're dealing with the police, give them a chance for input. Second, neutrality. People believe that the police are making decisions, establishing policies based upon facts and in an impartial and fair way that doesn't discriminate. Third, respect. People believe that the police treat them with respect as citizens, respect as people, courtesy, dignity, that they are viewed as 
good citizens, decent citizens, not criminals, not deviants, not suspects, and that the treatment they receive reflects that. And fourth, that the police have trustworthy motives, that they are trying to do what's right for the people in their community, they're sincere in their efforts to do what's good for the people they deal with. These four elements, voice, neutrality, respect, and trustworthy motives, are central to public judgments about how much they trust the police. But why should we care, why should the police care, if they get this judgment of fairness, if the public thinks that they are being fair? The key to me is that research shows that the center of people's decision about how to relate to the police is this issue of public trust. Fairness or unfairness shapes high or low trust, which shapes desirable public behavior. And I'll talk about two behaviors in particular, obeying the law and cooperating with the police. The first thing is following the law. We know from research that one reason that people follow the law is they think it's legitimate. When people trust the police, the courts, and the law, they obey the law. More legitimacy, less crime. And particularly important, people obey the law even when the police are not present. If they believe it's appropriate to follow the law, they follow it because it's the right thing to do, not because they fear being punished for breaking the law. This means that when we create trust, we are actually fighting crime. Creating trust and fighting crime are not in conflict. In fact, building trust is a crime-fighting strategy. Further, when most people in a community follow the law because they think they ought to, they free up police resources to target smaller groups of people and locations that are known to be high crime. Research shows that this strategy of focused deterrence is the most effective way to manage crime in a community best uses the resources of the police, and it's enabled by widespread trust in the police in the community. In contrast to this argument, the aggressive force-based style of policing that we see in many American communities increases the future likelihood of criminal behavior. There's a direct connection between experiencing aggressive policing and being more likely to commit crimes in the future. One reason is that we know that force-based policing undermines the mental health of the people who deal with the police. We see symptoms of trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, everyday stress, all sorts of mental problems coming out of experiencing aggression on the hands of the police, and those are associated with having trouble managing well-being in your own life for adolescents with trouble developing normally into a law-abiding adult. Conversely, as I've said, contact with the police doesn't need to be stressful. It doesn't need to have these negative consequences. When the police treat people fairly, they can deal with them and build trust at the same time. Trust-based policing reverses these negative effects of aggressive force-based policing. Further, evidence shows that when people trust the police, they cooperate. If you talk to many police leaders, they will tell you that one of their frustrations is they can't get cooperation in fighting crime from their communities. They go to a crime scene, there are 50 people standing there, no one saw anything. So we find that one important behavioral consequence of higher trust is more reporting of crime, more testifying, being a witness, and higher clearance rates on the part of local police. So a second way that legitimacy promotes crime control is because it promotes cooperation between the police and the people in the community, which helps to manage social order. A crucial difference between currently popular focused deterrence approaches, which I mentioned are best practices for reducing crime today, and trust-based policing is that focused deterrence lowers the crime rate as long as the police are present. But trust-based policing is aiming at the long-term goal of cooperation among the people in the community so that people take more responsibility themselves for social order in their community and the police don't always have to be there to make crime go down. So trust-based policing is designed to ensure safety 
in ways that also promote popular support for the police, feelings that the police are legitimate. And there are short-term and long-term gains. Long-term gains in the sense of long-term reductions in crime through cooperation, short-term gains in terms of less resistance, less hostility, more acceptance of police authority. Probably the most important point is that this trust-basing policing approach enables a long-term strategy for managing crime because, as we know, the best strategy for managing crime is to prevent crime from occurring in the first place. As was mentioned earlier, the police often say that you cannot arrest your way out of crime. What they mean when they say that is you need long-term economic and social development to promote solutions to crime. Creating a new job, a good job, is a better way to spend money than hiring more police, is what research tells us. So studies suggest that when people trust the police, it creates a climate of reassurance in their community. That climate of reassurance encourages people to work, to shop, to live, to be involved in their communities, promotes economic and social development. So in the long term, trust-based policing helps us to lower the crime rate by building communities that have less need to be a basis for crime because they're more developed. So it's a developmental strategy for reducing the rate of crime. The key point to me in all of this is that a trust-based approach does address issues of crime control, but it does it in a way that both speaks to the concerns of the public and speaks to a long-term strategy for improving communities. Now, I think it's also very important to say that this approach not only helps the public, it also helps the police. And I very much am saying this in the spirit that the chief just talked about, about the problems that police departments, police officers have. Two problems. One, stress. Being a police officer is not a great job. It has all kinds of stress-related problems. It has health problems, mental health problems heart attacks, divorce, alcoholism, suicide. Why? Because the police work in a very stressful environment. And part of the reason they work in a stressful environment is they, are, they have a very hostile community in many situations that they're dealing with. Second issue, police safety. It's a dangerous job and we need to protect police safety. But again, research tells us that if people trust and have a more cooperative orientation towards the police, Policing is less stressful, and it's less dangerous, because these strategies de-escalate conflict, they lower the likelihood of resistance, and anger, and pushback, aggression <coughs> against the police, a less stressful environment, and a safer environment. So in fact, this is good for the public, it's good for the community, and it's good for the police. Now one additional comment about the police that I think is really important is Many police officers also work in very unfair environments. One of the things that we've found in our research on police officers is all of these elements of procedural fairness that we're training these officers to enact when they deal with people in the community are often absent in police departments. So the internal dynamics of the department can be very autocratic, very capricious, very confusing, and, not, and opaque. If police officers experience procedural fairness in their own departments, we know a lot of good things happen. One is they do their jobs better. Their superiors report better job performance. Second, they have better mental and physical health. Third, they're more likely to treat people fairly out on the street because they have experienced and understand the concept of fairness in their own department. Okay, so in summary, what, what's the point here? Research points a clear path forward for policing in the 21st century. The strategies associated with this path are effective, they're supported by research. As I've said, they're shown to be desirable because they respond to community concerns, what people in different communities want from the police. They respond to police concerns about having an effective strategy for managing crime and social order. They respond to the long-term goal of community development as a way of developing out of crime. And they make being a police officer a better life 
for police officers. So thank you very much.